Bibles, whatever form you brought them in, to Matthew. We're going to continue in our study in Matthew 7. You know me, those of you who have heard me preach a long time, I tend to stay away from dissing other people. I don't want to preach against stuff. I want to preach for Christ. And so I'm kind of walking on eggshells this morning because this passage brought me to a place where I just have to speak out against some false teaching that's going on in today's world. And that's part of my mandate from Scripture. As a shepherd, I have to warn the sheep if there's a wolf. (laughs) And we're going to get to that passage in verse 15 today to see how Jesus told us to watch out for those ferocious wolves because they'd like to be able to devour those sheep. So what I say today, I say with a loving heart, and I say it with the warning, not because I want to put down anybody who's out there, some of whom may be well-meaning, but they're just teaching wrong. And I want us to get to know what the Bible really says so that we can be firmly grounded on the Word of God and on Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone. I first ran into uh, a teaching that I think has done a lot of damage, and it's called, and, and please, don't, please don't think that I'm thinking that everybody who's a part of this movement is a bad person. The Word Faith Movement. Have you heard of it? Are you familiar with it? I first came in contact with it because I had a professor in college who was under the teaching of a person who's considered sort of the grandfather or the founder of the Word Faith Movement. And basically, it's sort of a couple of different things. First of all, the words that come out of our mouth are important, and I agree with that. But they would take some of that to an extreme and say, all you have to do is speak the truth about what you know God will do for you, and he'll do that. If you ask him, which is where we're going to get into this, ask, seek, and knock, that passage. If you'll ask him for something, if you have enough faith, that word is going to come true. And you just need to name it and claim it. That maybe you have heard. There's another aspect of that. They would say, we don't want any negative confessions. Because sometimes if we would think, oh, if I say something that I disapprove of or that I dislike or that I don't want, like a headache, for example. If you say, oh, man, I'm really bummed out because I have a headache today. You say, oh, don't say that. That's a bad confession. If you don't say it, it won't come true. You just have to believe that it's not there and go on forward. And so one of my professors was really being influenced by this kind of stuff. And she came to class one day. And it was oratorial class where I met my lovely bride-to-be. And one day, our professor, who was a woman, came without her glasses. Now, she had glasses, and she, she got to the point where she was about my age now, and she needed glasses all the time in order to see the music, and we were working on Handel's Messiah, which is a difficult piece of music, and there's a lot of notes in there. And so she came without her glasses one day. And she was doing a lot of this trombone playing stuff, you know, trying to get in there. And somebody asked her, said, "Uh, Mrs. D, did you forget your glasses today? What's going on? She goes, no, I'm not going to have a bad confession that I can't see. I believe that God has healed my eyesight. And I'm trusting him at his word. And she was literally bumping into the doorway and dropping books. And she couldn't see. And she missed half of the cues. And It was just embarrassing. All the rest of us were there. It was kind of like, oh, how do we respond to this? Because we're seeing that this is not really happening, you know, and yet she's claiming it to be true. And is that bad? And do we have a lack of faith if we don't believe it too with her? And so we we went through a couple of days of real agony, wondering what was going to happen. And then one day she showed up and she had her glasses on again. And somebody was thinking, well, I wonder what's going on there. She goes, no, I believe God healed me. It's just going to take a while for the healing to take place. That's all. That's kind of how she came about. So when I started diving into what this word faith movement was like and reading up more on some of the proponents of that, boy, I just couldn't really get behind it. Not when I saw what we're going to be studying today in Matthew 7. There was one guy who wrote in one of his books, he says, you must realize that it is God's will for you to prosper. This is available to you. And frankly, This is what really kind of caught my attention. It would be stupid for you not to partake of it. And I thought, did he really just write that? Now, here's the question. I do believe in Scripture that when we obey God's commands, things tend to go better for us. Absolutely. I have no doubt about that. And many of the people that I know have done quite well because of their jobs, because they have a good work ethic, because they're having Christ-like character qualities that are born out in their jobs. So therefore, many people, People are more affluent and more prosperous than people who don't follow Christian principles. But when you take this stuff to an extreme, just like any good truth, if you can take it way off into an extreme, it becomes a bad thing. So I would ask the question, is it always God's will that we prosper? 
Is it always God's will that we are spared hardship or harsh treatment at the hands of evil people? Is it God's will that we stay healthy and never have an illness until such time as God decides to take us home? And that's always been a little bit of a question of mine too. At what point do we say this is kind of ludicrous because we all have to become ill enough to die at some point because of the curse of sin and death way back in Genesis? And so none of us are going to get translated like Enoch and uh, there's not going to be a chariot of fire that's going to come down and swoosh us up to heaven. We're going to die. That's just a part of the curse. Uh, that's what happened way back when sin entered the world in the first place. So because we're living in this time after the curse and before glory, we're going to experience some of those things. And it's difficult. To that kind of teaching, I would say, no, don't buy into that stuff. And the reason I say that is you could read in Hebrews 11. The first 34 verses sound really good at first blush. You know, at face value, you look at the first 34 verses, it says, this person had faith, and this person had faith, and Abraham had faith. It was credited to him as righteousness because of his faith. And all these good things were happening. And then you get to about 35 or 35b, and oh my goodness, you think, this is some of what happened because people followed Christ? Listen to this. And and this is the hall of fame of faith. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released from prison, he means, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, some of them. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Now, does this sound like the prosperity gospel to you? It doesn't to me. It sounds like these people suffered at the hands of other people because of their faith in Christ. Verse 39 of Hebrews 11, these were all commended for their faith. It doesn't say this group didn't have enough faith and that's why they were treated this way. It said they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what has been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us, meaning in eternity, would they be made perfect. That's my background. I wanted to give you that backdrop before I launch into this passage in Matthew 7 so that you can see why I think it's so vital that we get firmly planted rock solid on the foundation, the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ, and what he actually said in his Sermon on the Mount so that we don't buy into teaching that could lead us astray and cause us to think at some point, well, I do have a headache. Does that mean I don't have faith? Because it's always God's will that I be healed, right? So how come I still have this headache? Maybe I... It has really messed up a lot of people because they have misinterpreted what Scripture says. All right, Matthew 7. Are we ready? If you're ready, say, yeah! Yeah! Okay. (laughs) Good for you. Ask, seek, and knock. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 12. Number 7, I'm reading, I believe, from the NIV. I didn't have that here, but that's the one I tend to default to when I'm copying stuff. Ask... And the tense of this means keep on asking with persistence. It means continually asking. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? little explanation here. They had these little flat stones that looked very much like the flat bread they would cook in these little stone ovens. And it, basically, he's using some tongue-in-cheek here. Christ is referring to some little sarcasm and humor. He's saying, would you dads trick your kids if they said, hey, dad, I need some more bread. And he looks around for a, a stone that looks just like the bread and hands it to him. And the kid cracks his tooth on the thing and going, ha, ha, I got you. He says, of course you wouldn't. That'd be cruel. Or which of you would give him a snake Instead of a fish. They actually, the word there probably means the eel that they had at that time. And the eels could actually deliver a bit of a shock. And so they would say, would you trick your kid by saying, give me a fish for supper. Yeah, here's a fish. Instead, you give him this snake-like eel. And you go, ah, no, of course you wouldn't do that. In other words, which of you fathers would trick your child? You wouldn't, right? Because you love your kid. And then verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, meaning at the heart because of the fall, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So, we've established right off the bat, yes, our Heavenly Father is good, he loves his children, he wants to give his children good gifts. That we can agree on, I hope. 
And then verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them to do for you. This sums up the law and the prophets. I have to default to that Inigo Montoya. We were talking about the Princess Bride movie the other day during our work day. And Inigo Montoya would get to this part where he would say, all right, uh, let me explain. No, there's too much. Let me sum up. And this is kind of the summation of the whole Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, let me explain. He goes, no, no, let me sum up. In everything you do, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. If you just have that one motivating factor at the base of everything you do, chances are you're going to fulfill all the rest of this kind of stuff. So that's the golden rule that we've come to know and love. Now, let's look at these verses for a few minutes and unpack just this section, shall we? Seven, uh, the first part of verse seven. If your father is near, you can simply go up to him and ask him. Ask him for what you want. He'll give you what's best for you, and he'll only give you good gifts, not harmful ones. Since dads were keeping kids this weekend, I thought this was appropriate because moms are away, and if the baby said, Daddy, I want some coffee, would it be a good thing for dad to say, Sure, no problem. We'll go to Starbucks. Now, some of you coffee drinkers will be going, yeah, and I would say, no, don't do that. We're not going to give the baby what's bad for it. Even if the child asks us for something, if we know it's going to be harmful, a good dad would say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this. This is not going to be healthy for you. So if you're close to your father, just ask. When I was a young kid, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. We had a fairly small home, a little ranch-style house. We had three bedrooms at one end of the house a hallway, a living room, and around the corner was a study where my dad would study for his sermons. And if I was close by, all I had to do was just speak to him and say, hey, Dad, can I have another drink? And if I was too young to get it for myself, he would say, sure, and he would get it for me. And when I got old enough to do it for myself, he would say, yes, you may have another one. You know where the cups are. And then he started training me in the ways of serving other people so I'd be a good husband someday. But if he was a little farther away... All of a sudden, I had to start seeking for him. And so he says, okay, if you're close, just ask. If you're not close, seek. And I think there's a good spiritual connotation here. I met a guy just last Sunday night, in fact, a week ago. His name was John. He had had quite the journey. Oh, my goodness. We spoke for 45 minutes, and he had started out going to church with his family. He had a good, strong relationship with Jesus. And then he said, and then I just slipped off track. He said it was slowly and incrementally. It wasn't any great big running for the other side of the pasture. I just inch by inch get farther and farther away from the Lord until I was trying to fill my life with everything that I thought would bring me satisfaction. I was making a lot of money, so I was working extra hours. I was buying a big house. I bought the real fancy car, and I had all the toys. I had a four-wheel drive, all-terrain vehicle, and I had a TV, flat screen, and all that stuff, and I was miserable. And in order to fill that void, I started defaulting to self-medication, and then I got to drugs, and I was uh, smoking marijuana every day, sometimes up to six hours a day. And he said, and I realized, you know, I'm still not really satisfied, and I can't understand why, because I'm a Christian, right? And then he lost his wife and his family because she had had enough, and she said, I can't do this anymore. And he hit really rock bottom. And to hear him speak today, he is literally a changed guy. I mean, he's just a different man altogether. He's become a new creation in Jesus Christ. He said, I think I was giving lip service back there in the early days, but I know him, and I know he knows my greatest needs, and that I know I've been forgiven. And I know I'm responsible for all the stuff that happened in my past, and yet he's forgiven me all that stuff. He said, it wasn't because God, this is the part that goes with this, it wasn't because God got farther away from me, it's because I was so distant from him, but it was me who moved. And I think there's a spiritual thing here. You can ask. If you're close to your father, just ask. If you're doing all the spiritual disciplines, you're going to church and you're reading uh, the Bible, studying it with other people, if you're praying, all you have to do is ask because you're close to the father. But sometimes we allow ourselves to just kind of inch by inch get separated from him and there's a distance between us. You know, that's okay because he wants to be found. All you have to do is seek him. If your father's behind the door, just knock. He'll open it. I used to have to go down the hall and around the corner to his study sometimes because sometimes my dad would know that if I was playing my music a little too loud when I got old enough to have a stereo, he would want to shut that door so he could listen a little bit better when he was studying for his sermons and whatnot. And I would just knock on the door, and he never said, "Ah, get out of here, I told you I needed some privacy. He never said that. Fortunately, I had this good example for a dad, and he would say, yeah, come on in, son. What do you need? All I had to do was knock, and he would open the door. That's the picture we have here. Jesus is saying, look, the heavenly Father wants to open the door. 
He's accessible. He wants you to seek him. He wants you to ask. And if you really feel far away from him, just knock on the door. He'll open it. He's there for you. Notice in verse 8, this is how we know he's accessible because it says, God, the Father will answer how many people? Everyone who asks. Everyone is the key. That's not exclusive. That's inclusive. He wants everybody to ask because he wants to have a relationship, even though many people won't. Now, let's look at how God the Father gives good gifts to those who ask wisely. And this is where we start to get into some more of that discernment like we talked about last week. Sometimes he'll answer no. Sometimes he'll say not yet. And sometimes he'll answer yes. Now, I've been informed that there's this new term that's really popular these days called free-range kids. Kind of cracked me up. Uh, I heard a little snippet on NPR on the way home the other day, and I didn't have time to listen to the whole thing. But some people are up in arms because they're these kids that the parents just basically leave roaming around all the time. And I thought, well, that's kind of the way I was when I was a kid. My, my mom and dad trusted us enough when we got to a certain age where we were allowed to ride our bikes within a certain area around our neighborhood because it was a safe neighborhood. And we were even able to go up to the market, which was a quarter mile away, if we had allowance money and we were allowed to spend it within limits. And they taught us how to be responsible. So I thought, okay, I guess I was a free-range kid and I turned out okay. But I think what they were discussing was what constitutes truly a free-range kid and what constitutes neglect. When I see what's going on here, I see that a good father wants to set boundaries for his children. Our kids became old enough and responsible enough that because we were in a quiet neighborhood and we had a market that was only a quarter mile down the street, they got old enough to say, okay, if you go with your brother or sister, you can go and pick up that loaf of bread that mom needs for supper tonight. Here's the money. Make sure you get enough change. Remember to count it out. We're teaching them mathematics skills. We were such good parents. And we got to where we could actually send them down the street and pick up that loaf of bread and come back. But that was only after we had established the boundaries and only after they had proven themselves trustworthy by obeying us within the boundaries we had set when they were younger. He who is faithful in little shall be faithful also in much. They grew in their ability to ask for things. When they were younger, some of them, like age five, if my son had said, Dad... Can I ride my bike over to so-and-so's house? I'd say, no, that's three miles away, and you might get lost. I don't think you can do that. But when he got a little bit older, he would ask me the same thing. And of course, he had proven himself. I knew he knew the way. I knew he was safe. I knew he could handle himself, and I would say, yes. You see the difference? I see that Jesus, just as he was talking about discernment as well, is asking us to be wise in what we ask for and how we ask it. If we know our dad well we're going to pretty well know what he's going to say yes to and what he's going to say no to. And if we ask for that thing that's in our Father's will, he's going to desire to say yes. And that's where becoming a discerning, mature Christian comes in. I knew a good friend uh, named Bill, Bill Eardenson, his wife Paula, great people, had a great sense of humor. He and I spent uh, a week one day trying to get to Reno, Nevada to do a missions conference. (laughs) Felt like a week. Bill and Paula felt called to missions service, and they really felt called to Tanzania, Africa. God just put Tanzania on their hearts. They went through the application process with the International Mission Board. Then it was called the Foreign Mission Board of Southern Baptists. And they had all the criteria met. I mean, they they were strong people that had years of experience in the local church. But after they'd gone through the interview, which was a very detailed interview process, this person said, I'm going to recommend that we not grant you permission to go yet. And they were devastated. They said, why? Why would you say that? We meet all the criteria. He said, in our interviews, we found out that Paula is so tightly connected. Her apron strings are tied pretty tightly with her mom. They talk on the phone sometimes six, eight, nine, ten times a day. And they're always involved in what's going on. And we've seen this in other missionaries before. When you're thrust into a completely foreign culture and suddenly you don't have that connection anymore and you certainly won't, and that was certainly before international cell phone days too back then, he said, we think that she might really implode and within six months you'll be back here in the States. And they said, well, what do you recommend? And we say, we're not denying you completely forever. We recommend that you get another ministry position in another state and do that for two years and see how that goes. Because that will give Paula a chance to see if she can actually make it apart from her mom that many miles. And if you can do that, we believe you'll be good to go. Now, you can imagine they were just heartbroken at first. 
to get that kind of news when they had just gotten their hearts set on going to Tanzania, but they went to, of all places, Reno, Nevada, the place where we had done this missions conference earlier, and he got a great job there as an associate pastor. He had a wonderful, thriving ministry. Paula learned to cut the apron strings a bit, and the International Mission Board gave him the green light, sent him to to Tanzania, and they spent the next 30 years in a wonderful, fruitful mission service in Tanzania. Sometimes the wise and loving father says, not yet, because he's seeing a bigger picture than we can see. And it's hard to trust, isn't it? I mean, it's hard when we want to get to that next stage right now. And we ask him and he says, I love you. Not yet. It's hard to trust that, but we need to. Paul, the apostle, is another good example of somebody who asked continually and persistently, just like Jesus is telling us to in the Sermon on the Mount. He had that thorn in his flesh, whatever that might have been. Some people think it was literal flesh and it might have been in eyes because he had written at one point, see with what large letters I'm writing to you, and they thought his eyesight was going bad with the glasses and stuff. I tend to think, and that might have been the case. I wasn't there, so I don't know for sure. I tend to think it had more to do with self-doubt. And usually when you think of the word flesh, he was thinking more philosophically and theologically than he was literally. You remember that he was the one who had condoned Stephen's death and had been having Christians arrested and thrown into dungeons and just terribly mistreated, and yet he got saved, that road to Damascus experience. Can you imagine being the guy? No wonder he called himself the chief of sinners. I'm sure he lived with all kinds of self-doubt, and we all can do that. But he asked the Lord three different times, it says in 2 Corinthians 12. Three times I asked him, Lord, can you deliver me from this? Can you take this thorn of my flesh? Take it away. And he said, and God finally said, and I love this, because you can imagine God, the heavenly father, with that loving look in his face, arm around him, no, son, I know what's best for you. And so my answer is, no, I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to give you something better. My grace is sufficient for you. And that phrase just comes in so strong when we've been praying and we've just been persisting in prayer and we still don't feel like we're getting to where we need to be and we can almost picture God putting his arm around us and saying, I love you, and the answer is still no because my grace is sufficient for you. I've got something else for you that's even better than this and I'm building your character so that you can get that which will last so much longer than what you would get if I gave you the answer to this question right here. It's hard to pray that way. I don't typically want to pray, God... I want you to deny me all of the stuff so that I can grow in my character. I don't deal well with that. I'm not a terribly patient person at heart. And God keeps saying, my grace is sufficient, son. Be patient. Keep persisting. Keep trusting me. I'll get you there. Now, the narrow and wide gates. Let's look at this quickly. This is where the Scottish people would need to hike up your kilts because we're going to run through this next section. Narrow and wide gates, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, he says, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Verse 14, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The wide way gives us a picture of no limitations, no holes barred, do whatever you want to do, and that's fine because there are no consequences. It kind of made me think, I don't know why I was thinking about this, of the old Disney version of Pinocchio. You remember Pleasure Island? When the boys get enticed to go over to that island and they're all just playing pool and drinking and do all the stuff they want to do and there's no rules whatsoever. But you know, it didn't turn out so well because they all turned into donkeys and then they wound up getting sold into slavery. And that's kind of a picture of the bondage of slavery to sin that happens when we have no boundaries whatsoever. And that's the picture that's the wide way. Many are on that. One thing about that, though, you're never alone when you're on the broad path because there are a lot of people on that same path. You may be in a minority when it comes to being that person who's on the narrow way, but it's still the best way. There's a narrow gate. It's really kind of a hole in the rock, sort of a window rock in Sedona, Arizona, up Schnebly Hill Road. It's a gorgeous place just east of Sedona, some of the prettiest country that God ever made. And I grew up going to Thanksgiving and Christmases in Sedona because my grandparents lived there. And we would go up Schnebly Road and then we would hike. And there's a particular place that some people knew about that it was a little precarious because it was a little bit steep. But if you'd kind of climb along this little ledge and get out there and climb right up through this tiny little opening, 
you could step out onto this big vista rock, and there's nowhere else on that mountain that would give you a view like the one you got after you had gone through that narrow opening. But, oh, man, the view that you got when you stepped out onto that ledge was stellar. It was incredible. It wasn't easy to get to. It took some effort. But you had to go through the narrow way in order to get that view. And I can see that Jesus is saying, if you would just trust me by staying on the narrow road, even though you feel like you're being denied some things now, oh, man, I'm not going to deny you anything when you get through that opening, the narrow gate, because the vista is going to be fathomless. You won't be able to believe what I've got in store for you. It's worth going through the narrow opening. True and false prophets start at verse 15. Watch out for false prophets, he says. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? I do this with my grandkids when I'm reading to them. You know, you can read something that you know is very wrong because you know that they're old enough to be able to know that it's wrong. And you'll say, wow, isn't that a pretty green truck? And they go, that's not green. That's blue. And it's almost as though Jesus knows there's this broad audience out here, and he's talking about this stuff. And he says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? And I bet there are a few of the kids in the audience that probably said, no. (laughs) Or figs from thistles. And the same kids would go, no. And the parents would be going, shh. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not, and this is the really uh, kind of verse right here, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's a sign of judgment, isn't it? Thus, by your fruit, you will recognize them. Verse 21, true and false disciples. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is not talking about working our way to salvation. It's talking about the fruit that's born because of what's inside. Constantly gets back to that. This comparison between outward appearance versus inward truth. Many will say, Lord, Lord, on that day, meaning the day of judgment, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons? And even in your name, perform many miracles? As though suddenly they had bought this ticket by their good works. They said, we got the ticket. Look, I had the ticket. It says, admit one. I purchased it. I bought it with all these good things that I did in your name. And he's going to say, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now the question is, how is that possible? How could somebody perform miracles in Jesus' name even if he never knew them? Well, there's such a thing as counterfeit signs and wonders and we can even see that in a little later in Matthew's gospel in Matthew 24 24 he says there's going to come a time when they're going to be false Christs and false prophets and they're going to perform great signs and wonders in order to try to deceive even the elect if that were possible and the way it's worded it sounds like and it's not because if you're truly elect you're not going to be able to be deceived you'll see the truth but they're going to try they're going to give it their best shot by doing these counterfeit signs and wonders. So we have to discern the spirits, test the spirits. So here's this comparison that we're seeing unfolding in this passage. The false versus the true. We've got the broad way, we've got the narrow way. We've got the wolves, we've got the sheep. You see how that's starting to unfold? He's giving all these analogies, these word pictures, to get us up to speed on what it means to be a true follower and to be a false follower. You don't get figs from thistles. Figs were healthy and edible, but you wouldn't want to make a meal out of thistles. You'd be pulling the little thorns out of your teeth. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. So what makes a tree good or bad? It's what's on the inside. Again, he brings us right back through all of his analogies and his illustrations in this Sermon on the Mount. He brings us all the way continually back to what's on the inside. Those of us who have trusted Christ are going to have the Holy Spirit on the inside. He is going to be conforming us into Christ's image. It's Him doing the work. It's not anything we can do. We can't punch the ticket by our good works. It won't work. If we try to do that and we'll hold up the ticket, He'll say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. But if we say, I'm with Him, and stand next to Jesus, and He'll say, yeah, He's with me, because He trusted me. It's the Holy Spirit who's doing this. A good passage to always check this, if you're looking at discerning the spirits, is Galatians 5. 
There's that huge comparison there between the first part, 19 through 25, shows what fruit is born of the flesh. And then you get that second part, uh, it's, and the 19 through 21, I'm sorry, 19 through 21 says this is the fleshly fruit. People who have that fleshly fruit will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. They're denied access. But then that second group of people, 22 through 25, shows the Christ-like fruit, which includes, some of you have memorized these, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruit born of these good trees. Those are the people who will inherit the kingdom of God. A person can only bear this kind of fruit if they have Jesus Christ living inside them through the Holy Spirit. So on the day of judgment, he brings it right down to brass tacks here. He's winding up the sermon. There are two types of people, only two, on judgment day. Those who bore Christ-like fruit, those are the sheep, those who are on the narrow road, and then those who bore fruit of the flesh. Now, we also have different picture later on where he talks about the sheep being separated from the goats. I don't want you to confuse that with the wolves. <laughs> okay, the, the goats are not the same thing as the wolves just so you're clear on that. But there will be a separation, and those who are in Christ will be sent one way. Those who are not in Christ are going to be sent another, and it's not going to be pretty for those who are not in Christ. Jesus will say, I never knew you to those folks. Now, he gets right down to the the end, and he's probably thinking, because he can see the eyes of the people in his audience, and he's thinking, there's some people who have been stirred by my sermon, and they have been inspired by it. And they're thinking, this guy's a really good teacher. And he is. But then he just wants to make crystal clear before he leaves that he leaves on the right note. And he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. And I think it's good because we all know that In other passages of Scripture, the rock of our salvation is Jesus Christ. In verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. He wanted you to know that he put those people in the category that he even used a strong word. He called them foolish He said, you would be foolish to build a house on the sand knowing that a storm could wash it away at any given moment. And then in verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. They were always quoting from Rabbi so-and-so who was quoting from Rabbi so-and-so, and they kept adding all these quotes from other rabbis, and they couldn't actually express anything as though it came straight from God because they had to sift it through all these quotes from everybody else. It was almost as though Jesus was speaking as the voice of God himself. Go figure. He was God himself. He was God the Son, incarnate, to show us exactly what God is like. So it's no wonder he spoke with authority. He was God speaking to us. That's why if we start to come in contact with teaching that we think may be off base... Where do we check it? Where do we test the spirits? We dive right back into God's word. We read in the New Testament about who Jesus is. He's the rock of our salvation. I'm going to go with what he says over somebody else who's misquoting somebody else because they've built a theology incorrectly off of a couple of little things that they took out of context. That's why it's so important that we revere God's word and continue to build our lives on it. It's not about legalism and putting all your check marks in the right place. It's the entire teaching of Jesus. And he says, and if you're going to do that and say, hey, he's a good teacher, but you don't do anything based on my teaching, you're like that guy who built his house on the sand. So here's the thing. If we're going to apply that today, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, I'm never going to stop growing in this. I need to continually study God's word so that I'm continuing to pour his word into my heart so that what comes out of me bears good fruit. It's a never-ending process. I don't want to slowly gather uh, steam heading in the opposite direction and pull myself away from that teaching because I know that my life can come apart in a moment. Even though I might still be saved, 
I can bring terrible consequences on myself if I pull away from God's teaching. So I need to do that. Secondly, there are people, a lot of them today, that would say, oh, yeah, I believe in a supreme being. Okay, that's good. But where do you stand on Jesus Christ? Do you stand on Jesus Christ? Do you believe that what he said is true, that he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Can you say, along with Simon Peter, I believe it was the one who said, there's no other name by which we can be saved. No other name. Because if you don't have that part right, it can be like these people that were watching him teach and they were amazed at his teaching, but if they don't put it into practice by living for Jesus, you'd be like that foolish man who built his house on the sand. I want a whole bunch of rock-solid believers next to me, which is why I preach with such vigor that I want everybody to be able to take a stand on the solid rock and say, I trust Jesus. He's the basis of my salvation. It's only because of what he did for me that I'm saved, and I thank him for it because I know I'm going to be okay with him someday, not because of my goodness, but because he died in my place on the cross. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we have a world desperate for truth. We're desperate for truth. We see all around us so many misteachings and people who are just leading people astray because they're taking people in so many other directions other than onto the rock of their salvation. And I want just so desperately for the people that I know and love to build their lives on the rock so that we'll have a great reunion, those of us who are on that narrow way. And even though there's rejection for those who speak up for Christ, and sometimes people will say, you don't know what you're talking about, it's still worth going on the narrow way. And even in that Hebrew, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 passage in the, the Hebrews Hall of Fame of Faith, there's so many people who are mistreated on the earth, but they're enjoying their rewards even now in eternity. So whatever discomfort we may have, it's going to be worth it staying on the narrow way because you promised so many wonderful things to those who stay firmly grounded on your word and on the rock of Jesus. I pray this, and I pray that people here today will not just say he's a good teacher, but that they'll say he's the Lord of my life. I want to build my life on that and on him. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus and with his authority that makes this possible. 